to focus on comparatively the national higher education. I could keep going, but that's a long list. Um, a very, very accomplished person with great family institutes. So I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Anna Ortiz. Thank you so much, Jim. Well, hello, everybody. It's very, very nice to be here. One always gets a little nervous when you get these extra numbers of people here because I want to make it worth your while to spend a very lovely summer day here. This is a treat for me to be here on, on many levels. Just to be warm is one of the things. <laughs> <laughs> it actually has been very cold in Michigan until just recently. Then it got really warm. We got out all our summer clothes. I pulled out my sandals and it literally on the last Thursday it went back down to 40 degrees. And so I spent a day shooting. Oh, so this is rather fun to be here in such a beautiful place. But as Jim said, it is true that I admire greatly your institute. I um, had the pleasure of being invited here for various events over a number of years. I am so thrilled to see my long-term colleague and friend, Ken Simpson, here, and other alumni alike. So I have a bit of a soft spot for your institute because I really do admire your colleagues, your students, a number of whom I've met in groups I've Always been very committed to your institute and very, very impressed with the quality of the work that the students always do, also. Uh, so it's really a great pleasure to be here with you. Um, what I thought I would do today is share with you uh, some of my interests in issues around globalization change. It is true, a lot of my work has to do with faculty work, faculty careers, early teaching work. But um, in the last decade or so, I have also had involved in interest in faculty work has led me to be quite interested in issues around organizational change. And the way that occurred really was quite naturally as I was involved in various projects that typically had to do with faculty. But as we got involved in them, we realized these are really projects about organizational change. And so what I want to do today is share with you some of what I've been learning um, and perhaps it will be of interest to you as we as we talk together. So I wanted to start out by saying, this will give you sort of a sense of how I have got interested in issues around organizational change as a rather natural progression from my, uh, my interest in faculty work. I come up here what I call several change challenges. And these are real things that I have been involved in and many other people I know here have been involved in. The first one has to do with effective teaching. Several years ago, probably about uh, five or six, I was called by the National Academy science education in Washington. They had a big task force going that was looking especially at STEM education. In STEM, most of your progress is through science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. It actually includes, at least by the National Science Foundation definition, social sciences as well as the, uh, the traditional biology and chemistry and physics and so on. They called me, uh, a commission was working there on something called discipline-based education research. And basically what they were trying to do is create a faculty book about what do we know about effective teaching and how can we get more of that effective teaching happening in your interest group especially in the STEM areas. And they called up and said, could I please write a commission paper? And I said, really what we'd like you to write about is why won't faculty change? That literally, that's what they said. Why won't faculty do what we know about effective teaching? Because change isn't all that you can do. Well, we actually have a lot of evidence about the uh, NSF and other called evidence-based teaching research as well as about teaching learning. So I said, hey, could you please tell us why faculty won't change? And I ended up writing a paper that it can only be 15 pages, but it's probably the most impactful piece of writing I've done in terms of what people say to me about it. And really what it was is a, an analysis of how does the academy work? What are the issues around the culture? What are the norms? And how do you how do, we, how do we understand why it's so hard when we know a lot about effective teaching to actually instantiate that approach, those approaches, multiple approaches, in our colleges and universities? So what I thought about, that really becomes an issue, not about why we can't get things that really get really work to change, but really an issue about organizational change, as I thought. Then there's the issue about faculty members that I put up here. I think, arguably, many, many faculty members often lot of preparation to teach. It's increasing on many campuses nowadays. Uh, but many faculty members begin to teach because they have lots and lots of experience, and yet they want to be a very good teacher. That, in 
Something called the Center for the Integration of Research, Teaching, and Health Services. So it was all about comparing doctoral students in STEM fields, particularly, to the effective teachers as well as really effective researchers. But you know, behind all that is also a question about how do we think about change happening in the meeting again? Like faculty members who can do the full array of work from health research, public service, and outreach, as well as teaching. And we have a lot of does not necessarily fully address that possibility here. So in a way, that's non-traditional change potential. And then there's the issue, which I've also been involved in, about the strong commitment I think so many of us have, and this is what I think makes it challenging for us, to create more inclusive and more diverse environments to really welcome the whole array of talented people, particularly into the faculty, because they become the exemplars and Students. And yet, there's uh, it's slow progress, I think, in most of our universities to really diversify our faculty. And I'm hearing it going at a steady pace in our faculty diversity with the growing diversity of our students. This is particularly the case. I've been doing a lot of work for the last decade in the STEM areas, and it's very much the case there. There are a number of areas still in the sciences where uh, individuals of color and women are still heavily so we certainly have a commitment, and yet our universities are kind of slow to change. So why is that? That becomes an organizational change issue. So that's how a lot of my work on faculty has rather naturally led me to figuring out what the heck do we need to do. So I wanted to share with you today some issues about, I guess I'll call them lessons or observations that have come from things I'm hearing about research, about practice, that have to do with fostering change. This is a very big area. So. I suspect I will I will highlight a few things that I think are emerging from projects I've been involved in and also from my work at the National Science Foundation where my goal was uh, to work with a lot of uh, researchers around this area. Um, but I, I, I certainly have to kind of cover the whole waterfront of this. So I'm going to share some of the things that I think are quite interesting. And I also want to share some of the challenging issues I thought of just like this with faculty members and graduate students who might be interested in my thoughts, there may be many other thoughts about some of the really challenging issues that we hear research and study to us. I started to tell you a little bit about this, about how I'm interested in some of these. Um, I am a professor of higher education and clinician at Searle. I've been involved in that for years by doing a lot of my research activities. It's an applied project, but it has a full research uh, set of projects with it. It's also, and I'm going to be drawing a lot on this, I'm a fan of the National Science Foundation Project that my professor Dan Stanislav did a colleague on the Center of Excellence in Colorado to study um, 25 of the universities that have had the benefit of what Nassau calls the grants grants. They're grants to specifically to help universities expand or they especially focus on women and now there's a strong emphasis on men and women of color um, in the academy with faculty roles. And my colleague and I were quite interested in this as a measure of equity change um, for women. And we have been able to study 25 of the universities using qualitative methods, um, interviews, sur also surveys, and case studies um, to, to explore how do these universities go about this kind of change process. Um, and I've evaluated a number of those with my projects. And then some of my work has been advising to a lot of work in STEM. I did just spend two years on the UK Penn University to work with the National Science Foundation. Um, they wanted a, a colleague who focused more on organizational issues and faculty issues and change issues. So I thoroughly enjoyed that. One of the highlights uh, there, I met most of my colleagues there were from chemistry or physics or computer science or engineering. And one day last year, they were kind of privileged to talk about that I was somewhat demurring on offering a, an opinion. I said, you know, you know, I'm not a social scientist. So I'm not. These were all people in engineering and health sciences. I said I'm not really one of you. You folks should decide about this. And someone piped up and said, "Oh gosh, we consider you one of us now." That was a great moment to me because working in the um, in the natural and physical sciences has taken quite a while to be 
to be a welcome kind. Not mm -hmm. being always welcoming. Being <laughs> so here are some of my observations that I thought might be of interest to you today. I want to really think about change as a, a systems challenge, as I call it. And there are lots of perspectives on change. There are people on the change who are well familiar with these. We often talk in higher education about the change issues as being really messy problems. And we've really had the benefit of sociologists, political scientists, uh, psychologists, and higher ed scholars who study change and offered us, I put up uh, some of the theories here, our colleague in higher ed, Adriana Kurzar, has given us some very good work on this, and we have theories, we have some epistemology theories that focus our attention on how important leaders are. We have evolutionary theories that say be sure to attend to context, that's really important, that's just something that's really important to do. We have social cognitive theorists who say think about the thinking process, the sense making, the meaning making of individuals in the organization, that has a lot to do with change. We have cultural theorists who, who point our attention to the symbolic and meaning making issues in organizations. Political theorists who bring our attention to influence, power, coalitions. Um, I want to honor all of this work because it's, it's informed a great deal of work on higher education. But I also, I, I chose a, a, I've been working on what we call the Big Bar approach to some of her work that says, essentially what she was saying is, let's not constrain ourselves when we are taking these theories and trying to do the applied work. And we were talking about this link between theory and application right here. So we need to think of these theories as helping us see a lot of the layers of the issue. And we need them all, sort of these theories, to help us understand organizational change. And yet we still have the challenges in higher ed to actually move the thing forward. Um, so I'm quite interested in how do we take what we learn from theory and apply it? And so what can we learn from some of these very specific higher ed projects about the change process in higher education? So I wanted to point out as we got started, if we're taking a, a systems approach, that people you know, is the about this in higher research work that I've been working with is at the NSF who are people who are promoting projects or uh, offering up projects that are about to come to market. And here are the typically single, what I call single level learner strategies, at least theory of this, when you have a mentoring program that can go in there. Like, very good, but it's not going to solve the change problem. We know that we need multiple levers, I call them multiple levers of change. And I talk about working across the levels of the organization. That faculty member is working in the context of their department, their discipline, their college often, their university, and then the broader societal context. And there's features of those environments that affect how the choices that they make and the leaders they have. We have to remember the interconnectedness of these of the systems within higher ed where we're trying to address some of these problems that I was I went through before. <coughs> and more and more I'm uh, very because we want to be able to learn from simple contexts in ways that we can uh, get ideas elsewhere, but context, specific contexts are often important. So I want to talk a little bit in this series backdrop of some of what I'm learning and working with a college project that really took care of that for five years or two. And also, what can we learn from taking a systems approach specifically about changes in higher ed? And I'm going to be primarily talking about some of the broader <coughs> STEM areas. One of the things that we've learned, I would say, is the importance of a theory of change, of using a theory of change. And what do I mean by that? I don't mean only taking um, one of the, the meta theories that I mentioned before, but actually having a theory of change that is relevant to the particular institution and the particular change. So as an institution, a university, is working on issues of feeding or expanding the involvement of women in uh, science and engineering and mathematics and physics and arts and computer science. And that's a particular issue that I'm working on. How might we do that? And one of the things we've learned from, uh, I say we, I keep saying interacting with colleagues in uh, some of this work we've done with some of these institutions, is that having a theory of change that is specific to the institution makes a difference. Not just having a project to do something, but really thinking through and taking the time up front to analyze the problem. What is particular about this context? What can we learn 
some literature and theory that would help us understand the elements of the problem that our particular context. So we can talk about explaining uh, diversity and inclusiveness, or at least a uh, quote problem about uh, supporting faculty members to use more of what we know about tech and teach. What do we know in this context? What institutional data are they looking to? Are they involved in say uh, promoting or using? Why, what is unique to this topic here? Why is there a particular problem? <coughs> we know from the theory that will help us think about it, but what, what is particular contextual is here? What might be factors that contribute to the productive change we want, or what might be the advantages of the theory? One of the things I learned when I was a professional science foundation is that oftentimes leaders at universities are very effective at knowing they want to change something, but less effective about actually doing the upfront analysis to say what is the nature of our problem here. So I think of my work in the field of working at institutions. Figuring out your problem is first of all kind of necessary to do a really good dissertation, but it, I think it's the hardest part of all things to figure out what the problem is. It's the same with a lot of the uh, universities that have left and where changes they want to make in their campuses. So we know that oftentimes change problems what a little bit more about what do I mean by this observation that we're trying to change is contextually specific and useful. What does it involve? It's really three things. What are our change goals we need to achieve? How might we go about it? What are strategies? And that would come from backing up and really analyzing the organization. And then how do we know if the change actually works? The evaluation process. And I sum it out a little bit more here. Questions we might ask, you know, who is what problem? Why is this a problem that I want to change? And then thinking about strategies, we really could ask what strategies, but we have to step back, as I tried to say here, to analyze the context. What is it about the context that's specific that would lead us to choose a certain strategy? How did I think about this? Because I have been quite involved, both evaluating and then studying a number of strategies to create more inclusive environments. And because I've evaluated it, I've written some of those, I, I literally take a comment out where they write a proposal for this. And they'll say, what are the five strategies we should put in here? Just could you give me a list? <laughs> and you know, they're very hopeful <laughs> that I want because I do know a lot of the frequently used strategies. However, the answer always is it depends on the context. That's why I was showing you some of the theories behind this report, which is similar to the medical work. So developing a working theory of change, a practical working theory of change, that really involves thinking about the goals, but then really analyzing the context, the situation, in order to develop interventions. They're not a contextual intervention. And then also part of it is asking the question of how do we know if we're successful? How would we know if we were moving towards success? How would we know if we were working with compliant patients? What would be the measures? I know there are many people here who think about issues around metrics and measures. Uh, those are often important. So one of the observations I've learned working with uh, people and I've worked on my own project with colleagues and working with other people who are trying to affect practical change projects, one of the things I've learned from working on some of the theory and seeing the art around it is that institutional change leaders really need to take the time to think through their theory. They need to take the time to think through and find the between the goals and what they think they're going to do and how they're going to end up doing it. And that is quite a challenge uh, for many people <coughs> in the practical day-to-day -day world in our university environments. And then often we find, um, and others I've been involved in or been on advisory boards, that the leaders may have articulated either verbally or in writing their theory of change, but it's often not shared in written form. So the sharing is the observations I wanted to share with you. The second observation I want to share has to do with the usefulness of using what I call windows to enter change. And I have found it very useful in work I've been involved in for the user's perspective to actually do the search around organizational change. I found it very useful to 
the way the Bowman reveal is actually overlooked right now, but it's been, I find, very, very useful as a framework to use. To, to, you know, they don't, they they talk about it as more just a framework for understanding organizations. I have found it very useful as a framework for analyzing um, organizational change opportunities and then for studying them. And I suspect some of you know already that the Bowman change is on the reveal and other tools you can look at, and that it's situated really informed by some of the theories like the theory of Suzanne earlier. They argue that we can look at an organization through a four different lenses. And my argument would be these lenses can help us really analyze our organization, our context where we're trying to think about change and understand the need for change and adapt our community. So one of the, the frames to look through is looking at structures, looking at the policies, the organizational rules, how the organization is structured. Another frame is to look more at the human resources. Who, what are the human resources? What are the experiences, the demographics, the needs? We can look politically at issues of influence, of power, of resources. And we can look symbolically, which I think is often overlooked when we're trying to think about change and processes. Think about who is, what is the process of change making? How is symbol used in the community to make people make the change? I put up this, um, this diagram because it helps me to remember when we're thinking about change, that an important goal, such as um, towards the development of faculty, is embedded in these levels of the organization. In, uh, it's embedded in the individuals, embedded in departments, institutions, and the external environment. And so our change process has to think about what are the barriers, what are the opportunities, and what are the factors from those angles that are going to make some impact uh, on the change process. But I also put up here that I think we can then think about our change goal and how to go about it using these windows, structural, political, human resource, and uh, symbolic. And if we look through these different lenses, we see different aspects, different barriers, different aspects of the challenge, but we also see different ways, different levers for change. Are you with me here on this? So one of the projects that Dan and I were part of in the National Science Foundation from which we've been recorded for six years is a major project to look at 25 universities that have had grants to improve the diversity of their faculty, uh, particularly in regard to women and in regard to individuals of color. And you can notice some of these results. So my colleague and I, using this lens, trying to figure out, identifying some campuses that have made some significant progress, albeit in quite a bill, we can use this lens to say, what, what were the strategies for change? And it enabled us then to uh, look at a variety of ways the changes, levers for change in the context, this context, of creating a more diverse, a more diverse faculty, a more inclusive environment. And you can see up here, we can think structurally. What are some of the both possible barriers to change, but also potential levers for change that can be identified? And some of them, I think, as we brainstorm, we would think of immediately. Tenure and promotion is, is a major. I'm arguing here of structural things or policies that can be thought about. About how are people evaluated, how is their work uh, uh, assessed? Is a variety are a variety of kinds of work assessed? We can look at the reward systems. We can look at how work is organized. Who's assigned to do what? And are there barriers in those assignments that might preclude the activity of women or individuals of color? How is accountability handled? Similarly, with the human resources lens, we can next think about recruitment processes. How is that done? A lot of the universities that have had specific projects to diversify their faculty have particularly zeroed in on recruitment. How is recruitment done? How, uh, and they do lots of work, how the word is extended, who is in that broad net, what kind of messages are given to people, uh, what happens when that recruitment process brings people to campus, there's much right within that lens that we can look at. But there's other levers we can think about. We can think about professional development. It's not only a matter of having people come to our campus, it's how do we support the people? How do we ensure that everybody who's part of our campus has the resources, but also the knowledge to do what they're supposed to do? Mentoring and networking in terms of creating more inclusive environments has been a, a particularly favored lever for change, as has transportation and grants. These are these I can talk a lot about, but my point here is to make the 
the argument that to affect change on a campus in a big, messy problem, that we need to think about multiple levers that we're using, and we need to think about the multiple levels of the institution where they make a difference, in the department, in the college, in the institution itself. You can see some of the political levers that one can think about. I agree with you, not so much to say about leadership problems, but the practices of governance. How do you form committees? One of the ones I think has been particularly effective in the institution my colleague and I have been studying is how data are being used to affect change. That is, the use of data, not only for reporting, it's really a, for accountability, but it's also using data to generate conversations to help people see the possibilities of where they could go. For example, some of the institutions <laughs> that um, have created a set of levers for change around creating more inclusive environments have certainly developed increasingly robust ways to collect data. Uh, who is involved? Who's excluded? What happens with their um, their search committees, who gets tenure, who doesn't. But it's not only collecting and having the data that's important, it's what they do with the data. So a lot of the institutions I've been studying that are using this as a lever for change are developing ways to get data in front of department chairs, not only to send it and say, here's some data, but as an example, to convene groups of department chairs in a very cordial way and say, you know, we really are here to talk about the diversity of our environment. Let's together look at our data. Let's together talk about it so it becomes a meaning making process as well as an accountability mission. Uh, so I, that's been a particularly effective way on some campuses as a lever for change in the university and the field. And then the, the, the symbolic framing that always brings our attention to how we can use uh, symbols, sense making processes, communication, events actually um, to be levers for change. An example would be one of the universities that I study, it's in the West in Boulder, Washington, when they, uh, at their institution in Miami, they have a big tower, and I think it's like a clock tower, and when the teams win, something nice goes up there, some lights and everybody's happy and excited, and their mascot picture is up there. When they uh, began their process with National Science Foundation funding, it had what's called an advanced grant to move forward diversity and inclusion. They ended up putting on top of this tower a big A standing for advance. Now, at first, nobody knew what that stood for. I thought it was a pretty smart symbolic move they made because it generated all sorts of discussion about what is this. So this became then not a project that a few people were doing. They brought it right in, they used the symbolic of a lever to bring it right into the discussion of their campus. Another institution sent out on the holiday card to the provost or president, you know, they read the wish list and greetings to everybody, and then as you flipped open the card there, it said one of the things, it said something about, you know, we hope you're all grateful for a good year, and one of the things that it said is, we're grateful at this institution that we are making progress through this three-year advance grant towards our goal of greater diversity. Now, I thought that was brilliant on your holiday card. They could have highlighted all sorts of things. That's an example of, a, of using a, you know, a small thing, but it makes a big thing. So my point here is that there are a lot of levers for change, and oftentimes, practically speaking, we may know the theory, but practically speaking, we often in universities, I think, choose a few things, a few levers, but we don't necessarily think of a systematic way. And we don't necessarily think about these multiple frames to say what combinations of levers for change might be relevant here. How can we put them together in ways that are very appropriate for our campus? So one of the lessons here is that we really need, I think, to use these different frames to look to, to be very analytical, not only about our context, our problem, but about what levers would work in this context. And then how do we put them together in a strategic way? It's not just a matter of a pick one, pick two, pick three. It's how do we put them together in a way that they uh, leverage each other to create great impact for a particular situation. Context matters. And thinking strategically about these levers matters. I think I can say one other thing I find is interesting. This is an 
website that actually highlights a lot of these letters to change and provides some case studies also of institutions that are trying to affect change in their own diversity and inclusion and how they put together some of these letters. And it also shows uh, each letter and how it can be used in very different ways depending on the change goal and depending on the context. So those are some of my observations about then third, and uh, we have heard this observation that there's a change every time we do study. And I like to talk about what I call change issues as well as change strategies. And one of the things that Howard and I have been studying these uh, 25 universities and how they affect change, one of the things we learned is that it's not only the strategies, it's how they deal with certain issues that come about in the change process. And I want to talk about, just highlight a few of them, similarly using these frames, because it helped us to see, as we were doing our case analyses, we use these structural, cortical, human resource, and symbolic frames to help our thinking, to reveal things that uh, might not have been present in the past. And these are issues and what I call tasks that we're learning need to be part of change, need to be attended to as part of change processes. And if they're not attended to, uh, the, 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 there may be issues and concerns, or the process may not be as robust as it needed to be. One of them, well, it's structurally speaking, here are some of the issues that we learned about in our study in these contexts. Is one has to do with whether those coordinators, and it's also senior administrators or teams usually, whether the leaders of the change process are actually thinking explicitly about the kind of support mechanisms for the change process. That is, look, and I use the example here of a good term, interactional space. How do people across the university really connect about this change process? The, the challenge is sometimes people, a few people are working on it, and other people don't even know about the change process. And probably, I certainly could give examples at my own institution where that happens. So one of the issues that we're learning in places that are actually affecting change around either teaching improvement in one area or around greater inclusivity is that they really think about inter, what I call international spaces to connect people across the world. Secondly, from a structural point of view, we think about ownership. Who owns the process? And how do, you, how do people see themselves as part of owning the process? Some of that has to do with access to data or opportunities, as I talked to before, about using and thinking and talking about data. Who writes about it? Who's recognized for the process? So thinking about ownership, involvement, connection is, is a structural issue in change. And then another I put it in the structural category is how do we measure the impact of the change process? What are the metrics? What are the tools? The places that we've been studying that are making some significant progress on inclusivity not only have strategies to advance their inclusivity, they have metrics to actually measure it and use those to talk about it, to assess where they are. And I know you have many of you here who, who work in this area on this particular issue. We think about looking from a human resource lens at the tasks of the change process on a campus. Here are some of the, the tasks that my colleague and I have been doing. One has to do with the notion of socializing new people into so typically, on a campus, there's often a task force, any big project. There are people who are involved. But then the issue is, how do you think about the next generation? Who else gets invited into this, into these uh, talk about interactional spaces? But how do they get invited in? How do they get supported so that they learn the language, so that they feel part of the group, not sort of tag-alongs who came a little bit later? That takes some thinking. What do we do? Another task about time demands and priorities, because all of us have multiple things. And one of the stumbling blocks we're learning on these big organization institutional change projects is that other issues start to get in the way. So they, we can almost draw a graph that things are going really well, and then something else is happening at the institution, the budget, uh, the athletic problem, or maybe a legislative issue comes up. And it's very easy for competing demands to intervene. And that relates to the notion of changing momentum and energy as part of this, too, because people, the initial people are very excited, but how do you now get 
broader group of, of key peoples of the South America. If you think about from a political lens, my colleagues and I have particularly noticed that there's some very interesting issues around, I put these in the political area, around leadership issues. How does leadership change over different parts of time and has leadership changed by different individuals? Now, sometimes that question has to do with provosts or presidents who depart in the midst of an institutional change of government. Because if the people come in, often they're their own candidates, that can be quite a challenge. We have learned on some of the campuses we've studied about ways that faculty leaders have been able to keep up momentum even as institutional uh, senior leadership has changed. And there's a whole way to keep it up for that. But beyond the actual changing of people, <laughs> I see some good, yeah. We could talk longer about that, about how I see that happen on some campuses. I have a great example of the Pacific Peace Institution that has addressed this in a fascinating way when both their presidents and provosts departed. So we can come back to that if you like. But there's some other issues about leadership, and there are people who are here who study leadership or not, and this will resonate with and we have much to say. But what we're learning is that in an institutional change project, that the nature of what the leaders need to do changes depending on where in the process uh, we are. And um, so there's a lot to be said about how, and, and one, one example is that uh, dynamic leader needs were very important in the beginning, but there's the danger of that dynamic leader does not bring other people into it. And how someone transitions from a dynamic leader to more inclusive leadership will then be a really quite a challenge for some people. Um, there's, there's issues around governance. Uh, we have some campuses where it's the very strategic ways that senates and faculty governance bodies have been brought into change projects. They need very careful thought about how they do it. There's the political task of creating alliances. Who else might be able to support the project or the, the goal? Isn't, it's not directly in your area, but alliances would really enhance the process. There's the political change issue of handling resistance. Um, how, how does resistance get handled? Who are the resistors? What is the content behind that? And how does that get handled strategically? And then in most of these projects, particularly if there's been funding externally, external funding involved, it's the issue of institutionalization. The projects around inclusiveness or around new approaches to teaching, there's a lot of enthusiasm on the teaching front. Um, uh, it could be NSF, it could be the Kong Foundation, it could be Spencer, it could be W.C. Grant. Once that funding goes away, there's a challenge about the institutionalization. So these are some of what I call the political issues of class. And then I think there are, we've been learning from our uh, research, cultural and symbolic change issues. How do we actually nurture and develop the trust um, and the mutuality, especially as new people become involved? Um, how, how do we avoid an us and them? We're the people who are working on this. We own this. We care about it. And yet, of course, we want other people to come in. There's the, I think, the uh, both challenging but inviting issue of how language and meaning gets made. A lot of times, we know that groups create language partly to have people feel connected to a project, but that same language can exclude other people. Uh, so that's one of the challenges. And then I particularly have been interested in learning about how some campuses, in a very explicit and strategic way, use what I call celebrations and touchstones. Now, all of us like celebrations, and that's fine. But this is the notion of being very strategic about how some how a success is publicized and is and there have been some campuses that we've studied that are using to, uh, celebrations, for example, to really get across a message about the institutional value of excellence in teaching. And there's a real art to that because we want to make sure, we've learned, that the people involved are people who are highly respected across all areas of their work, not only in the teaching world. So those are some of what I call change issues that we've learned about and that have to be attended to and if attended to, the change process advances and comes out of the gates smoothly. And then finally, just to wrap up here, I've got four minutes over the 40, but, but I have about another minute to go, and then we can talk together, are some of the questions and issues and challenges that are particularly interesting to me. Again, not a uh, comprehensive list, but an area 
thought of where I'm interested, and I actually have some grant proposals out in some of these areas. And I thought uh, those of you who think about your own research and all of the problems that you face would be happy to hear about them. So some of the opportunities or challenges here, why I'm thinking more research and thinking, the people thinking would be valuable. I have to do some of these redemptions, but I put them here in areas where I really think we need research. It has to do with measuring the impact of change processes. Again, I'm talking about institutional change processes. And the two examples I've been given are the Princeton and Christopher Princeton University and moving many faculty members towards more practice of evidence-based teaching practices. But there would be other examples too. <coughs> How do we measure the impact? How do we know what does extent of impact mean? What constitutes success? Funders, when I was at the National Science Foundation, we were very, very interested in the program officer and any proposal who came in that they had a research plan as well as an uh, intervention or implementation. Those were a research plan and those were an evaluation plan. And how would you know if they were making any impact? Um, and those are very difficult questions because these are very messy problems. So figuring out the issues around impact um, instruments, um, impact on whom or on what, those are very important issues. Secondly, as I said in the paper, I'm particularly interested in issues around leadership for change. I don't study leadership as much as some people do, but I incorporate it in the context of studying how do we move faculty forward in terms of these change endeavors. And it's been very clear in the, the several projects um, that have informed my observations that I'm showing you here today, that there are different kinds of leadership needed at different points in the change process. And how to prepare not only senior leaders, but people who are working at all stages of a major change endeavor. Department chairs, deans, um, faculty members who are influence leaders but may not be positional leaders. The, the notion of leadership for change, I think, we have lots of work in higher ed. Third, um, the issues of institutionalization and sustainability is a big challenge. And I mentioned it's especially a challenge if some of these specific change initiatives have been encouraged by external funding. How to maintain the initiative beyond the funding and what it actually means to embed and uh, institutionalize a project it is a, a very big area, I think, for research and for activity. I think it's very helpful to engage in cross-organizational comparisons. I found it very useful in studying issues of Princeton University to be looking at a set of campuses and being able to see in a comparative way what some do, what some don't, what's idiosyncratic, and where the lessons might be that we can see across the institution. So I think more of that kind of research would be quite useful. And then I am very interested, and in fact have a I was checking my email just before I came here because I thought you'd be <laughs> tell me some good news. But I'm very interested in um, something I really haven't talked about too much here, but my work has taken me into, which has to do with networks. There is a growing number of networks for, that are supporting reform efforts, and I'm speaking especially right now around some big STEM creative projects. There are networks of individuals. For example, there's a whole group of biologists who they call Pulse Fellows, and they're working together across states to um, instantiate more evidence-based teaching practices in their departments and in other departments, and they're very interested in how they're doing it. There's a number of networks of individuals. Those are interesting, but what I'm particularly interested in right now is that there are networks of organizations that are working together to do this. So, for example, CERTL, I mentioned, is the one I'm particularly involved in, in leading, but that is a network of 42 universities that are working to change doctoral um, education. And um, there are networks of community colleges that are trying to change how the first two years of science in what we often call the gateway courses are taught in community colleges. Some of you probably know the work of Tony Wright, uh, who's writing about network improvement community. But I'm quite interested in how, in higher education, we're moving network
networks of organizations, not so much of individuals, but of organizations to bring about change. And a colleague and I have a proposal right now to actually study the five different networks and the stages <coughs> that they're going through. We're, we're learning, I mean, we know already from our preliminary research, that these networks of organizations are running into similar challenges at, life, at stages in their life development. And so we're very interested in, in learning more about that. We also know they're wrestling with the issue of how to maintain fidelity to a common goal that they have, but at the same time, have enough autonomy that each individual university can feel as though they can do things the way that they need to or they can do. Uh, and there's a continuing issue of sustainability. So these are some of the areas where I think there's, I'm kind of excited about some of the research and I think there's some very interesting development. So finally, just to wrap up here, it seems to me that you know, change is a very big issue. Lots of people writing about organizational change. I'm particularly interested in, in, in the uh, institution institutions. I'm interested in how I get theory and apply it into practice. And I see it both as a big challenge, but also a charge for us right now. That we really know, and I talk about two issues, the greater diversity and inclusivity of our campuses and the, uh, the commitment and then the implementation of actually using what we know about teaching in a way that that supports the full array of learning that we have. But there's other big problems like that. So I think this is a charge for us to think about, and it's a challenge for us. And those are some of the observations that I've had about the work that I've been able to do in this area. So thank you for sharing uh, some time with me. And I think I can answer questions or yes. hear your thoughts. <laughs> I was so pleased that you talked about faculty, but it seems to me that uh, top down approaches are often the, the problem. I wonder if 25 institutions are starting out helping run into that problem. The top, the issue of top down. Yeah, the, the, there would be much I could say. Here is in a nutshell. <laughs> but I don't know. The institutions that have made progress of the 25 that we've been studying, none of them would I say, gosh, they've succeeded, but the ones that we felt there was considerable evidence that they were making progress, um, are places that have both the involvement of some senior leaders and quite a lot of ground up support. And the basic argument I think I could mount evidence for is that I don't think these kind of major institutional change efforts are possible, they're possible to start, but I don't think they're possible to actually move to fruition if it's only a top down effort. But I also don't think, in most cases, so I'm sure there are exceptions, I actually think the, the faculty-driven efforts often need or benefit from uh, people in more senior roles who are providing support. And I can give you an example of that. In our effort with CERTL, the Center for the Integration of Research, Teaching, and Learning, this began over a decade ago with three universities, then it went to eight, to 22, and now 42. One of the things we learned when we were first working with and studying the first three institutions in the eight was that we had a couple examples of universities that had huge, I shouldn't say huge, that's not the right word, had strong support from a group of leading faculty members in the STEM fields, that is for uh, innovation in the preparation of graduate students. They could not get very much traction at all. They did not, these particular places did not have graduate deans or provosts or other people at senior levels involved. And they couldn't get very far with their work. Part of it was they couldn't get hold of institutional resources to move forward with it. So we actually learned with CERTL that as new institutions came in, that we needed to make sure that they had both strong faculty leadership, because it also, anything to do with teaching, and research and preparation of graduate students probably isn't going to go too far if the faculty don't support it. But we couldn't get very far without um, without gra graduate deans or associate provosts or provosts. So to the extent, and the, the other universities I've studied similar, that the bottom down, top up approach to me is there's some evidence for that. Does that resonate with any of your thinking? Or yes. Richard, does. <laughs> I really think it's very hard. You can't do it with only the senior people, and I think it's awfully hard to do it with the senior people. Thank you. We know that national institutions are not That's a 
really great. So the big issue here, of course, is that we know across the United States that patterns vary a bit depending on what type of institution you are, your institution is about to go. But we know that the patterns are a decrease overall in Q check time of position and a decrease in Montague and Radcliffe's term in the Broadway term for the weeks of 42. Um, so we can't leave that out uh, as a potential issue. Um, in the, um, the project that Ames involved with the 25 universities where we've been studying the efforts toward greater Cleveland urban and more, more recently to the urban metropolitan core, what we found is that um, some of the early institutions were not taking into account the diversity, the, the increasing changing of effective type. In more recent years, universities that have been involved and that are now getting to see what the worst of evidence of gender distance change are indeed being not just programmatic with that data, but being very explicit about how do they actually include um, the non-tenure track faculty in some of their strategies. Part of the reason is that in the STEM fields, especially, but it's also the case in humanities, there are a lot of non-tenure-track people teaching the early level courses. Mm -hmm. And so to, to leave out the, and um, in that, to leave out that group is to just create a kind of ignore of the larger pattern landscape. So there are campuses that are involved in that, um, it's called advanced, this big project called advanced. They, a number of them are now being very explicit about uh, what kind of policies that their institution have around non tenure track faculty. Um, is professional development a way of teaching and learning available for non tenure track people as well as for tenure track? But that's relatively new because in our campus right now, Michigan State, we have typically excluded the non tenure track faculty from most of our professional development. That there have been some special opportunities, but we haven't been as systematic. Now as a university, we are working very hard, I would say in some of the early work, we talk about academics when we're talking about professional development. Uh, that is, academics, uh, there could be pros and cons of this term, but this is kind of weak. Are people who are in tenure track positions or who've been close term, they're people close to non track track, but we're trying to create a more encompassing term and then have you know, one intervention for teaching change is professional development, just one, but one. And so we don't think systematically about how we include the whole group of faculty, we're losing some of the power. It's, to me, it's the same argument that uh, I think I would use if someone said to me, why should we care about the presence of women and individuals of color, say in physics or computer science or engineering or, or across the university? And part of my short answer would be, we needed the full talent of everybody we have. And therefore, we need to figure out uh, organizational systems that welcome, support, and retain the full group of people. So I think there is increasing attention in very strategic ways to the non tenure track faculty, but there's still quite a long way to go. We know that. One question that's coming out over the next you know, 30 seconds, but it's actually interesting. How did you measure political presence? I mean, because when you're doing in multiple universities, yeah. you do that rather anonymously. But if you're looking at one study, I, you know, how, yes. do you, um, how do you measure that control factor? And that might be a huge issue for what you need to report back. But so to step back, I didn't spend very much. I was joined by a number of studies mm -hmm. as well as work I haven't done, but that I've become knowledgeable about to bring into play. The particular study this involved 25 universities. The methodology for that, I actually went on for several years and then kept the data, um, involved initially looking at documents, um, proposals for their work, reports of their work, a, a very extensive document analysis, and then documents very unique to each campus. And then it involved um, kind of a there were some extensive telephone interviews with uh, groups of leaders of these projects at each campus. Uh, and then we were able to create sort of a survey where we wanted specific information. So it was a very targeted set of information. 
And then what we did was selected uh, seven institutions where we were on campus for a period of time doing uh, interviews with a lot of people. And we have a team of researchers talking to a lot of people. So in terms of pol political dimensions, an example would be a political issue. One of these places did have a president and a provost in part, and they've always been kind of ended there in different places. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know that I'd say we measured that. You know, there wasn't a metric measuring it. But we sought to learn a great deal about that by doing a range of interviews we did. And these were interviews where, as I'm sure you talked about a lot, you know, triangulating data, talking to people from very different perspectives. So what we were seeking is to understand that you know, political change in as comprehensive a way as we could. Um, I don't think anything was probably that, that I would call actually measuring. That's partly why I think we need some metrics not so much about the political world, but metrics about saying, if you want a more inclusive campus, what is the metric? One metric that you might say, well, of course, we count you know, people in different groups. That's a metric. And that's you know, how many women do we have? How many men do we have? How many people of this race or uh, ethnicity or that race and ethnicity? But one of the things about that that has been learned, not just by me, but say at the National Science Foundation, is that those metrics are only part of the picture. Um, you know, they certainly tell us about who's on campus, but what they don't tell us is about how the general climate is changing, you know, how the policies are changing over time. Is there a more um, welcoming environment? And so in that sense, there, I've been involved in conversations uh, to, with a number of people to say, what would be appropriate metrics? Because these challenging issues are not ones where you can say, well, we got that taken care of. They're, they're always in process, and the metrics are going to need to reflect that. But in answer to your direct question, in terms of the political aspects of this, that aspect was learned to the extent I understand it. I brought up some issues related to that. Was learned through um, cases, a pretty extensive case studies with multiple, uh, you know, a team, and a lot of time.